شريكا الاله فليس لي رب سوى المتفرد الوهابي Before we begin, inshallah, let's recap on last week's lesson. Before we ha we study something new, let's recap on last week's lesson. So last week, we did an introduction. We learned what is Tawheed. We learned what is Tawheed. Can someone tell us what is Tawheed? Who wants to go first? What is Tawheed? What did we learn last week? Naam. Sorry? To believe that something is one. Jade. And um, we also learned, uh, we answered the question, uh, is the word Tawheed mentioned in the Quran? And Ibn Al-Qayyim, he divided the whole of the Quran into five different types of verses. What's the first type of verse? What's the first type of verse? Naam. Tawheed of information. Tawheed of information. Verses that talk about information. About the names and attributes of Allah. What's the second type of verse? Sorry? So to verses that... What was the second type of verse? Sorry? Calling, calling to? Worship, sorry, calling, um, to worship Allah alone. Naam, verses that invite to worshipping Allah alone without associating partners. And this is the Tawheed of, what did he say, Akhi? Tawheed of? Talab. The Tawheed of seeking. That's two. The third type of verse are verses of? Naam. Commands and prohibitions. Fourth type of verse are? Verses that talk about the rewards of Tawheed. Fifth type of verse is? Punishment. Verses that talk about the punishment of Allah. Jameel. Okay. And uh, we also answered the question, is Tawheed mentioned in the Quran? Who can give me a verse where Allah mentions Tawheed? Or any of his derivatives? Any of the derivatives of Tawheed? What are the derivatives of Tawheed? So, Wahid, Ahad. Uh, is uh, Wahid, Ahad, and? Is there a third one? Wahid and Ahad. Naam. So these are the derivatives of Tawheed. So who can give me a verse that talks about that that actually mentions Wahid or Ahad? Naam. Naam. Wa qala Allahu la tattakhidhu ilahayn ithnayn. Any other verses? Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayy al-qayy. Ahad and Tawheed is not mentioned. Naam. Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Naam. Um, and uh, Naam. We also then started the book. So that was the introduction. Then we actually started the book, Thalathatul Usul. And the author begins with I'lam rahimakallah nahu yajib alayna. So, firstly, al ilm. What is al ilm? What was the definition that we gave to al ilm? Ma hi al ilm? Ma hu al ilm? Naam. Tfadr. Naam, al al madi. Naam. طيب هذا أقسام العلم لكن نبغى تعريف العلم العلم بحد ذاته كيف تعرف العلم فطلبك هو العلم يعني قريب <تصفيق> قريب جزاك الله خير نعم إدراك خطاب الشرع هذا هو يعني كونك تدرك خطاب الشرع you know, and what is إدراك خطاب الشرع my brothers إيش معنى إدراك خطاب الشرع نعم نعم يعني comprehending the statements of Allah and his messenger comprehension إدراك تدرك خطاب الشرع جميل and then we moved on to uh, هذا العلم ينقسم إلى ثلاثة أقسام المؤلف The author divided this knowledge into three categories Knowledge of what? What's the first one? Knowledge of? Knowledge of? Allah Second knowledge of? The Prophet ﷺ Thirdly knowledge of? Islam With? With? Evidences this, These evidences are categorized into two What are they? General and? Specific Okay, Al-Amal. What is Al-Amal? Ma huwa Al-Amal? What is the definition of Al-Amal? Kayfa nu'arrifu Al-Amal? Naam, Abdullah. Zuhuru khitab al-shari' ala al-abd. What does that mean? What does Zuhuru khitab al-shari' ala al-abd mean? To manifest unbelief. Kayf, yani? To, for example, 
salah mm-hmm. so the the manifestation of the khitab of the shar' upon the servant jamil excellent khitab al shar' ma what is khitab al shar' remember we we we're going to actually again khitab 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 this is a word that's going <laughs> to recur every day ma huwa khitab al shar' what is khitab al shar' statements The statements of legislation, such as, um, and and the Prophet. That's it. Khitab al Shar are the statements of Allah and the Prophet. If every, every if ever you hear this word Khitab al Shar, it means the statements of Allah, the statements of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam. Then a da'wah to ilayhi. What is a da'wah to ilayhi? What is a da'wah to ilayhi? Ma hi da'wah. Sorry? Inviting to Allah, the Prophet, and Islam. Inviting to Allah, the Prophet, and Al Islam. Then he, he cited Wal Asr in Al Isan Allah fi Khusr. In this surah, Surah Al Asr, what did Sheikh Muhammad al Adil Wahab say about Surah Al Asr? What did he say about Surah Al Asr? He mentioned something about Surah Al Asr. What is it? What did Naam? If Allah did not reveal, Allah only reveals Surah Al-Asr, mm-hmm. it, it would be enough. If Allah only reveals Surah Al-Asr, it would be enough. Where, what, where is the dalil for knowledge, al-ilm, in Surah Al-Asr? Illa al amanu. But that's Iman. Where is knowledge here? You need knowledge to have Iman. Can there be Iman without knowledge? Can there be knowledge? Can, can there be Iman if you have no knowledge? No, you can't. Knowledge precedes Iman, comes before Iman. First you have knowledge, then you have Iman. Where is the dalil for actions in Surah Al-Asr? وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Where is the dalil for da'watu ilayhi in Surah Al-Asr? وَتَوَاصُبِ الْحَقِّ What is sabr? What is sabr? حَبْسُ النَّفْسِ عَلَى حُكْمِ اللَّهِ أَحْسَنْتِ حبس النفس نفسي على حكم الله ما معنى حبس النفس على حكم الله discipline yourself upon the the decree of Allah عز وجل the حكم of Allah the decree of Allah is divided into how many categories two what are they the decree of Allah in his قدر and his legislation okay and where is the دليل for sabr in Surah Al-Asr. وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ طيب. And what did Al-Imam Al-Bukhari say with regards to knowledge action and actions? What did he say, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari? نعم أخي. أحسنت والدن. نعم. Knowledge precedes statements and actions. And actions. And what verse did Al-Imam Al-Bukhari cite <coughs> as an evidence, use as an evidence? نعم. That's it. That was last week's lesson. That was last week's lesson. Okay. So now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to take new lesson this week. Okay. Same style as last week. Uh, same tariqa. Be focused and concentrate as much as possible, inshallah. Um, there's going to be ta'arif, definitions, aqsam, uh, uh, categories, etc. Okay. But this is ta'seel ilmi. This is how, this is foundational knowledge. The knowledge that you will gain from Tharathatul Usul is going to set you up nicely for Qawaid al Arba, Nawaqid al Islam, Kitab al Tawheed. It will get easier. Okay, the more you learn, the easier it gets. If you've never heard of these things before, and this is the first time your system is hearing this, it may came, it may come as a bit of a shock to your system because you've never heard these ta'arif before okay but it only gets easy after this once you get accustomed to this and once you get accustomed to this style of learning uh, the style of al-mutun al-ilmiyyah and you uh, you, you you start to develop a relationship and an intimate relationship with the nusus with the adilla your your way of thinking 
when you're reading the Quran, the Sunnah will also change. You start to think like the ulama, think like the scholars. You start to understand how they derived certain rulings from certain evidences. Okay? And things become easier. And also you learn the language of the scholars. Khitab al-shar' Ta'rifu kada wa kada istilahu kada This is the language that the scholars use. This then becomes easy for you. The next book you learn, you're going to think to yourself, Ah, oh, I already learned this in Thalathul Usul. Okay, so you won't learn everything about e everything now. So, for example, a da'wa ilallah, sabr, you will only learn the basics now. The next book will give you more about sabr, give you more about da'wa, give you more about tawheed, and hakadan. That's tadarruj. Okay, so be patient, inshallah. Naam, fadl. Ilam rahimakumullah, and now we are jibu ala kuni muslim in one muslima. Ta'alam muhadi thalati masail. والعمل بهن الأولى أن الله خلقنا ورزقنا ولم يتركنا حملة بل أرسل إلينا رسولا فمن, أطاع دخ فمن أطاعه دخل الجنة ومن عصاه دخل النار والدليل قوله تعالى إنا أرسلنا إليكم رسولا شاهدا عليكم كما أرسلنا إلى فرعون رسولا فعصى فرعون الرسول فأخذناه أخذا وبيلا الثانية أن الله لا الثانية أن الله لا يرضى أن يشرك معه أحد في عبادته لا ملك مقرب ولا نبي مرسل والدليل قوله تعالى وأن المساجد لله فلا تدعوا مع الله أحدا الثالثة أن من أطاع الرسول ووحد الله لا يجوز له موالاة من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كان أقرب قريب والدليل قوله تعالى لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح من ويدخلهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن أولئك حزب الله ألا إن حزب الله هم المفلحون So the author رحمه الله تعالى here he mentions ثلاث مسائل عظيمة So he mentions three very important issues يجب على كل مسلم ومسلمة تعلمهن والعمل بهن So these three issues it is wajib upon every male Muslim and a female Muslim to learn them and to act in accordance to them So let's begin with number one the first المسألة الأولى So the first مسألة is um, talks about clarifies the obligation of obeying the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay the obligation of obeying the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam how so because he says the author says that anna allah khalaqana wa razaqana wa lam yatrukna hamalan bal arsala ilayna rasulan and he's trying to make you understand o reader that allah did not create us uh, Allah Azza, that Allah Azza wa Jalla, He created us and He's the one who sustains us and He did not abandon us. Hamalan, Lam Yatrukna Hamalan, He did not abandon us um, without a purpose. Okay, in fact, Bal Arsala Ilayna Rasulan, He sent to us a messenger. This messenger is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he clarifies to you that the Prophet was sent to you as a messenger. And then he says, whoever obeys this messenger enters paradise. Whoever disobeys him enters the fire. And then he cites as an evidence, Surah Al-Muzzammil, the ayah Surah Al-Muzzammil, Inna arsalna alaykum rasoolan shahidan, al ayah kama shahidan alaykum, kama arsalna ila fir'awna rasoolan. You should all have the translation of the ayah in front of you. Taib. 
Um, and then after that, um, he, Allah Azza wa here in this verse, um, he tells us that he sent to us a messenger. And this messenger is a witness upon us. He is a witness and a shahid alayna. Similar to how Allah Azza wa sent uh, to Fir'aun a messenger, yani the Prophet Muhammad, uh, Musa alayhi salam. What did Fir'aun do? Fir'aun, he disobeyed that particular messenger, yani Musa alayhi salam. And as a result, Allah punished him a severe punishment. فَأَخَذْنَاهُ أَخْذًا وَبِيلًا يعني أَخْذًا شَدِيدًا Very painful, severe punishment. Okay? Naam. So this is the first mas'ala. So the first mas'ala is... Uh, the obligation of obeying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the summary of al masalatul ula. So, what's the summary of al masalatul ula? The obligation of obeying the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The second masala, the maqsood and the objective of the second masala, is the um, a warning against shirk, a warning against shirk in worship. Not just any shirk, shirk in ibadah, shirk in ibadah. Okay, so the so number two, al masala to thaniya is a warning against shirk in ibadah, and that tawheed of Allah Azza wa is an obligation. Okay, so the second masala warns us against shirk and obligates tawheed. Okay, and obligates tawheed because. He says, أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَرْضَى أَنْ يُشْرَكَ مَعَهُ أَحَدٌ فِي عِبَادَتِهِ يعني he, Allah does not want and is not pleased that you associate partners with him in his worship, in his ibadah. Okay? In his ibadah. So the second mas'ala is all about a warning against shirk and the a clarification that tawheed is obligatory and wajib. Okay? Um... Naam. So here, you're going to notice that he mentions a da'wah. So he mentions here, in the second mas'ala, he says, uh, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا So he cites as an evidence, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Okay, so I want you to focus here. So the second mas'ala, what's the objective of the second mas'ala? What is it? Who can repeat what I just said? A warning against shirk in in ibadah and obligation. Obli- obli- that tawheed is ob- is an obligation, right? Okay, so it's about shirk in ibadah, right? Ibadah. Ibadah means what? Worship. Worship. Okay, the verse is Surah Al Jinn. Where is ibadah mentioned? This the verse in Surah Al Jinn. What does Allah say? Wa anna al-masajid lillahi fala tadu. Did Allah say fala ta'budu? He said fala tadu. Tadu means what? To supplicate and to call. So how can he cite, use as an evidence, a verse that warns us against dua li ghayrillah when, he's, when the whole mas'al is about ibadah. Ibadah and dua. How does that make sense? The Prophet said that dua is ibadah. Ahsant. Dua is ibadah. Well done. Dua is ibadah. Okay? Because when dua is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, Dua actually means ibadah. Dua actually means ibadah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Dua is ibadah. Dua huwa al ibadah. Do you all understand what I'm talking about, my brothers? Yani, when Allah says, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا It means, فَلَا تَعْبُدُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Okay? فَلَا إِنْ إن شَاءَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِنْ كِتَابُ التوحيد you will understand why that's the case. You'll get to know why and what's the evidence that dua is ibadah. Okay? But right now, all you need to understand right now is that dua is ibadah. And every time dua is mentioned, dua means ibadah. Every time ibadah is mentioned, it means dua. Okay? Jamil. Um, so that's al mas'ala to al-thaniya. Um, and... Uh, <coughs> And the third mas'ala, al-mas'ala to thalitha, the objective of the third mas'ala is the obligation of absolving yourself, freeing yourself from the mushrikeen. Okay? From the mushrikeen. 
Okay? So the third mas'ala is about you absolving yourself from shirk and يعني, the people of shirk. The people of shirk. Okay? He says, Al-Thalitha, أن من أطاع الرسول وحد الله لا يجوز له موالاة من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كان أقرب قريب. So the third mas'ala is all about freeing yourself from the mushrikeen. Okay? Because the person who uh, knows uh, the danger of shirk, hates shirk, knows the obligation of tawheed, this will lead this person to freeing themselves and absolving themselves from the people of shirk, from the mushrikeen. Do you understand how the, the correlation between the two? So, war- a warning against shirk, obligation to tawheed, leads to absolving yourself from shirk. How can you love the people who commit these things, commit shirk, and who hate tawheed? It doesn't make any sense. So this is the iman of, this is for the qa'idah, the principle of al-wala wal bara Loving for the sake of Allah, hating for the sake of Allah. That's the, that's the third uh, maqsad. Okay? Naam. So, from up until now, all of this is the introduction to Thalathat al-Usul. From here at this point now, we have completed the introduction of Thalathat al-Usul. Do you understand? So we, the introduction of last, last week, so the book, I'lam rahimakallah anhu yajib alayna, Thalathat al-Usul actually begins from here. It begins from I'lam arshadakallahu li ta'ati. That's when the actual book begins. Before that is an introduction to the book. Does that make sense? Okay, let's continue insha'Allah ta'ala. Naam. I'alam arshadakallahu li ta'ati anna al-hanifiyyata millata Ibrahim an ta'abud Allah wahdahu muqlisan lahu al-deen wa bithalika amar Allahu jami'a al-nasi wa khalaqahum naha kama qala ta'ala wama khalaqatu al-jinna wal-insa illa liya'budun ومعنى يعبدون يوحدون وأعظم ما أمر الله به التوحيد وهو إفراد الله بالعبادة وأعظم ما نهى عن الشرك وهو دعوة غيره معه والدنين قوله تعالى وعبد الله ولا تشرك به شيئا حسبك طيب so the muallif هنا the مصنف رحمه الله تعالى he says أن الحنيفية اعلم أرشدك الله لطاعته he says, Anna al Hanifiyata Millata Ibrahim. Okay, Han the Hanifiyya Millata Ibrahim. So now we're going to understand what is Hanifiyya. Inna Ibrahim kan umma tanqani tan lillahi hanifan. Walam yakum min al mushriki. What is Hanifiyya? What is a Hanif? Okay. So Hanifiyya in the Sharia has two meanings. Hanifiyya, legislatively speaking, has two meanings. The first meaning is a broad general meaning and it is Islam. Okay? It is Islam. So if ever you hear Hanifiyya, it means Islam. This is the general meaning of, of Hanifiyya. The second meaning <coughs> is khas, is specific. The second meaning of Hanifiyya is specific and it is to turn to Allah Azza wa Jal in Tawheed and that causes you to turn away from everything else to turn away from a- everything else besides Allah Azza wa Jal by absolving yourself from shirk I repeat the specific meaning of, of Hanifiyya is Al-Iqbalu ala Allah bil-Tawheed wal-Maylu amma siwahu bil-Bara'ati min al-Shirk wa Ahli Al-Iqbalu ala Allah so the second meaning of Tawheed specifically is to turn to Allah Azza wa Jal in Tawheed. And as a result of you turning your face to Allah Azza wa Jal, turning your heart and everything towards Allah Azza wa Jal, then this causes you to turn away from everything else besides Allah Azza wa Jal by absolving yourself and freeing yourself from shirk. Do you understand? So the, 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 the meaning of Hanifiyyah the asli meaning of Hanifiyya is to turn to Allah. Inna Ibrahim kan ummatan lillahi qanitan 
إن إبراهيم كان أمة قانة لله حنيفا حنيف The Prophet Ibrahim was a Hanif means he turned to Allah عز وجل When you turn to something automatically that causes you to turn away from something else Right? Your face If, you t- if I turn that way that means I've turned away from this side Right? If I turn this way then I've turned away from my right side Hanifiyah is like that So the meaning of Hanifiyah is to turn towards Allah in Tawheed This then causes you to turn, because you're turning towards Allah Azza wa you're going to automatically turn away from everything else besides Allah Azza wa by freeing yourself, absolving yourself from shirk and the people of shirk. Jameel. Um, now, um, he then says, uh, with regards to Al-Hanifiyyah, uh, uh, Allah Azza wa actually it's not in the, the kitab, but Allah Azza wa um, uh, why did Allah Azza wa Jal um, uh, Why did Allah Azza wa Jal uh, Describe the Prophet Ibrahim specifically as a Hanif And no other Prophet or Messenger Why wasn't the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Although the Prophet Muhammad Lashak was a Hanif as well But this p- specific honorary description Was given to the Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam And no other Messenger, no other Prophet What's the reason? Does anyone know? Naam, Muhammad But other prophets as well, their people worshipped idols as well. The Prophet Nuh, he couldn't even save his own son, the Prophet Nuh. The Prophet Adam was one, uh, Prophet Nuh as well. He, they, yeah, and there were many prophets the prophet, yeah, and that will come only with one follower. Some of them with no followers as well. Uh, Naam. The Prophet Muhammad was closer. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was the closest to Allah Azza wa He was the. There are five prophets that are known as Ulul Azmi min al Rusul, but the Prophet, our Prophet Muhammad alayhi afdal salatu wa taslim is Khalilullah as well. Naam. Many prophets abandoned. The Prophet Yunus was uh, swallowed up by a whale. Ahsant. Naam. The father of all of the prophets. And mess every prophet that came after the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam was related to the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's the first reason. So the first reason is that um, that uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal He made the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi afdal alayhi salatu wa taslim alayhi salam. He made the Prophet Ibrahim as an Imam and a leader for all the prophets that came after him. Okay, so he was the imam for all of the prophets and messengers that came after him. That's the first reason. The second reason um, is that uh, the people of uh, the Quraysh, Quraysh was the tribe that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ belonged to. They were the first to hear the message of Islam from the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ before any other tribe. They uh, knew they they knew of Prophet Ibrahim and they have had high they had a lot of respect for the Prophet Ibrahim and they would even claim to be upon the Milla of the Prophet Ibrahim. Milla means the way of life, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal, the reason why the Prophet Ibrahim is mentioned in numerous places in the Quran is as a reminder to Quraysh that the Prophet Ibrahim worshipped only Allah Azza wa Jal and did not associate any partners with him. And yet you claim to be upon the way of life of, the, of Ibrahim, but you are not. So it was like a hujjah alayhim, like a proof against them. So th- that's the two reasons why the Prophet Ibrahim was singled out as a Hanif, uh, besides all the other Prophets and Messengers. Jameel. Then we move, now that we know al Hanifiyah. so now I want you to always connect everything to the Matan. The most important thing is you understand the words of the author. I'lam arshad anna al Hanifiyah, millata Ibrahim. You know what Hanifiya is? You know Millat to Ibrahim. Why Hanifiya? Why didn't he say Anna al-Hanifiya to Millat to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Would that be a lie if he said that? No, he wouldn't. If he said Anna al-Hanifiya to Millat to Ismail, Millat to Ishaq, Millat to Adam, Millat to Nuh, why Millat to Ibrahim? Now you know why, those two reasons. Okay? An ta'bud Allah wahdahu mukhlisan lahu al-deen. Now we're going to learn Ta'bud Allah. Ta'bud Allah comes is a verb. 
Abada ya'budu ta'budu, that's a verb. So now we're going to learn, my brothers, um, what is ibadah. We're going to learn what is ibadah. Okay? So ibadatullah fi shar' laha ma'nayan. Worship of the worship of Allah in the legislation. When men, what does that mean in the legislation? What does it mean, shar'an? When mentioned the Quran and the Sunnah, يعني it means that if you see ibadatullah in the Quran and the Sunnah, if you see wa'budullah wa la tushriku bihi shay'a, if you see mathal wa ma khalatul jinna wa nisa illa li ya'budun, if ever you see ibadah in the Quran and the Sunnah, it has two meanings. It has two meanings. Okay? The first meaning is imtithalu khitab al shar'i bil hubbi wal khudu'. It is to comply with the khitab of the shar'ah. What does khitab of the shar'ah mean? The Quran and the Sunnah. Khitab means the statements of, the, of Allah and His Messenger. Okay? So it is to comply. You complying with the khitab of the shari'ah bil hubbi wal khudu' through love and humility. Khudu' means to, to humble yourself and to be to have humility. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, the this is ibadah bi ma'naha al am. So ibadah has two meanings. One meaning is am is general. What is that meaning? What is that meaning? What I just mentioned now. To comply with the khitab of the shari' Who's the shari' Allah and is the Prophet وسلم, to, through two things through love and humility okay love and humility okay uh, why love and humility why love and humility yani if you don't love Allah Azza wa and you start you pray but you don't love him can we can are you a worshiper are you someone who did ibadah no. So there has to be love in your heart for Allah and you can't have arrogance. You have to have khudu'. You have to have khudu'. Okay? So this is the general meaning of ibadah. So this definition, let me ask you something, my brothers. This definition, is this definition defining um, the essence of ibadah or the types of ibadah? The essence of ibadah. What does the essence of ibadah mean? Hmm? Mm -mm. No. The feeling that you have sent while you're worshiping Allah. So this is how you should. We should feel when you're standing in the salah. This is how you should feel when you're rec when you're reciting the Quran because it's ibadah, right? This is how you should feel when fasting, when making Hajj. When slaughtering for the sake of Allah an animal, when f when any ibadah, when paying zakah, any ibadah that you're doing, you have to have this feeling. You're complying with the khitab of the shari' through love, with love, having love of Allah for Allah and khudu' and humility. So this is a definition of the essence of ibadah. And this is a general definition. Ibadah also has a specific definition. It is tawheed. Simple. The specific definition of ibadah is tawheed. Okay? And uh, so now that we know the general meaning of ibadah, the general meaning of the essence of ibadah, and the specific meaning of the essence of ibadah, now we're going to learn the definition of ibadah when looking at the types of ibadah. Do you understand? When we look at the types of ibadah, what are some types of ibadah that you all know? Salah, Dua, Hajj, Som, Zakah, saying Assalamu Alaikum, right? What about heart? Khushu', Khawf, Tawakkul, Dhikr, Seeking Knowledge, Raja, um, all of these. What about statements? Ibadah with regards to the tongue and the statements. Dhikr, reciting the Quran, saying Assalamu Alaikum, Shahada. Um, sorry, good words. Al kalimu tayyib. For example, saying good things to your brother. This is if you do it for the sake of Allah, it's ibadah. Tayyib. So to define, how do we 
We need a sentence that basically summarizes for us every type of ibadah. One sentence that summarizes every type of ibadah. Who knows? Naam. Naam. That's it. One sentence. Naam. Sent. This definition is the definition of Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah in his book Al Ubudiyya. Okay? Ibadah, what, what, are we, what are we defining? Ibadah in the sense of what? Types of, types of ibadah. Not the essence, the types of ibadah. It is, ibadah is a term, is a term, it's a term, a comprehensive term uh, for everything that Allah loves and is pleased with from the statements and the actions whether they are apparent or hidden okay statements and actions whether they are apparent or hidden Jamil Naam Khawf The fear of Allah Azza wa Jal falls into which of these categories? Ismun jami'un Likulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu Min al-akhwali Wal af'ali Al-zahirati Wal batina Okay So khawf falls into statements Or actions What do statements and actions mean? Statements of the tongue, statements of the heart, actions of the limbs, actions of the heart. The heart has actions. So, مثلاً, tasdiq, believing in Allah, in la ilaha illallah, this is a statement of the tongue, oh sorry, of the heart. When you say la ilaha illallah, this is a statement of the tongue. Raja, hoping for Allah, this mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, is an action of the heart. It's something that happens in the heart, in, outwardly and inwardly. It's inward, يعني. it's an inward action. So this statement encompasses every type of ibadah. Jamil. Um, naam. Naam. And then the author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, um, he says, um, and then and Allah wahdahu mukhlisan lahu din and then he says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ and then he says, وَمَعْنَا يَعْبُدُونَ يُوَحِّدُونَ so he says the meaning of يَعْبُدُونَ يُوَحِّدُونَ so he defined ibadah, let me ask you a question, did he define ibadah with the general definition or the specific definition? Specific. The specific definition. The specific definition was what? Tawheed. Jameel. Jameel. So, um, the reason why he defined ibadah with the specific definition um, uh, the reason why he defined ibadah with the specific defi- definition is firstly for the, f- the first reason is that the most important ibadah is Tawheed. So this is by looking at the essence or the types of ibadah. La- type of ibadah. The most important ibadah, if someone says to you the most important worship is Tawheed, that means there are less important worships, right? Salah, which one is more important, Tawheed or Salah? Of course Tawheed. Without Tawheed there would be no Salah, right? So by looking at the types of ibadah, the most important type of ibadah is mada, is uh, tawheed. So that's the first reason why he defined ibadah to be tawheed. Okay? And the second reason is that the legislator, uh, that the, 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 the Allah Azza and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the word ibadah is mentioned, when the, whenever you see the word ibadah in the sharia, then the first meaning that comes to mind 
is Tawheed, always. In, if you see Ibadah in any place in the Quran and the Sunnah, then it means Tawheed. So, مثلاً, the first Amr and the command of, of the Quran is what? What is the first Amr of the Quran? When you begin from Surah Al-Fatiha, what's the first Amr? Naam. Ahsant. Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum. Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum. That's the first Amr. O oh people, worship your Lord. U'budu rabbakum means wahiduhu. So, u'budu means tawheed. Every time you see ibadah, it means tawheed. Okay? And the relationship between Tawheed and Ibadah is a relationship of uh, is a relationship of um, uh, is, a, is, is an all-encompassing relationship and a specific relationship as well. So Ibadah encompasses Tawheed and Tawheed encompasses Ibadah and sometimes Ibadah has its own meaning, Tawheed has its own meaning. Okay? So the first situation, it depends on the situation. So, what, so the question we need to answer is, what is the relationship between Tawheed and Ibadah? Depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. So the first situation is, if we look at the intention of the heart, okay? If we look at the reason the Ibadah is being uh, uh, performed, the reason why the Ibadah is being performed which is obviously the intention of the heart. Okay? So if we look at it from this angle, Tawheed and Ibadah are going to be the same thing. Because um, every worship that you do, the reason why you're doing this worship is what? To worship Allah, sincerity. To have Tawheed of Allah. Tawheed is sincerity. Do you understand? So if we look at the reason why ibadah is performed, then Tawheed and ibadah are going to be the same thing. When, so if I ask you a question, when are, when, the, when are Tawheed and ibadah going to be the same thing? Your answer is going to be, when we look at the intention or the reason why a worship is being performed. That's the first situation. The second situation is, if we look at the types of worship, if we look at the ahadul ibadah, the different types of ibadah and worship, then ibadah is going to be uh, more general than tawheed or more specific than tawheed. Let me, uh, let me say that again. If we look at the different types of ibadah, okay, Different types of ibadah, and we learned some of these types. Salah, zakah, hajj, siyam, tawheed, qiraat al-Qur'an, salamu alaykum is ibadah, you know. Um, if we look at the types of ibadah, alhamdulillah, then is ibadah going to be more general, more encompassing, more broad than tawheed, or is it going to be more specific than tawheed? More general. Some, some people said it's more specific. It's going to be more general. Why? Because ibadah has so many different parts. So many types of ibadah. Tawheed is just one type of ibadah. The most important, sah, but one type. There are other types of ibadah. So you can see, by looking at the situation, so if we look at the objective and the reason why ibadah is being performed, then Tawheed and ibadah are going to be one, the same. If we look at the types of ibadah, then Tawheed and Ibadah are going to be the same or different? Different. Okay, so you have to understand this, inshallah. Um, I'm going to give you a hadith now, and then I'm going to ask you a question to see if you've understood. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, um, uh, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. And then he said to him, Inna ka ta'ati, O Mu'adh, you are going to a people of the book. So the, let the first thing that you call them be, La ilaha illallah. Ila ani yuwahidu la to tawheed. Let the first thing you call them be, let that be to tawheed. If, if they respond to your call, then uh, call them to the, so the five daily prayers and then zakah wa hakada. Tayyib. So if we look at this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
Um, he mentioned فَلِيَكُنْ أَوَّلْ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ يعني تدعو and we learn that dua is ibadah, right? We learn dua is ibadah. So is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here talking about ibadah um, in the ibadah in its in its uh, in its uh, meaning of essence. The es- is he talking about the essence of ibadah, or is the Prophet sallam here telling Mu'adh call them to this ibadah, this worship, and then another ibadah? By lo- so is the, is the Prophet looking at the types of ibadah here, or the essence of ibadah? The types of ibadah. So the Prophet g- gave him a priority, tawheed. Once you once they learn tawheed, then prayer. Once they learn prayer, then zakah. So it's not the essence of ibadah here, it's the type of ibadah. So by, by learning this principle and this qa'idah, you will be equipped. You will know when you, whenever you read the Qur'an, whenever you read a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and you come across ibadah, you're going to know whether Allah or His Messenger, depending on what you're reading, is talking about here the essence of ibadah or is talking about the different types of ibadah. Do you understand? So this is very important to, for you to know. And then... The author, rahimahullah ta'ala, he then says, وَأَعْظَمُ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ التَّوْحِيدِ وَهُوَ إِفْرَادُ اللَّهِ بِالْعِبَادَةِ وَأَعْظَمُ مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ الشِّرْكِ وَهُوَ دَعْوَةُ غَيْرِهِ مَعَا يعني The most important thing that Allah commanded to is Tawheed. And then he defined Tawheed as being a singling out to Allah Azza wa Jal in worship. And the, the greatest thing that he prohibited us from is shirk. And shirk is da'watu غَيْرِهِ مَعَا Worshipping others besides him. And then he mentioned the dalil. Jameel. Um, so after mention, so he then he mentioned this and then he de- he defined tawheed. So now, inshallah ta'ala, now um, uh, you know the servant, or sorry, the reader now, the student of knowledge now knows al hanifiya and you know the definition of al al hanifiya You know that uh, part of hanifiya is to absolve yourself from shirk. Now. You need to know Tawheed, you need to know the meaning of Tawheed and the meaning of Shirk. What is Tawheed? What is Shirk? Jameel. So this is very important. So Tawheed has two meanings legislatively, Shar'an. So Tawheed has two meanings, Shar'an. Okay, so the first meaning of Tawheed is a general meaning, is a Am. The first meaning of Tawheed is general, Am. And it is, Ifradullahi bihaqqihi. So Tawheed, بمعناه العام, a general broad meaning of Tawheed is إفراد الله بحقه It is to single out Allah Azza wa Jal and to make Allah Azza wa Jal one in His rights. To give Allah His rights. Okay? That's the general meaning of Tawheed. And the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal are two. The rights of Allah Azza wa Jal are two. So Allah has haq alayk, has rights over you. So what are the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal over you? There are two, Allah Azza wa Jal has two rights over you. The first is haqqun fil ma'rifati wal ithbat. It is the right of Allah's right in knowledge, in knowing Him and affirming His existence. Allah has a right over you that you know Him. And you affirm his existence. This is the first haq of Allah Azza wa over you. The second haq of Allah Azza wa over you is the right of Allah Azza wa Jal of worship and seeking. Worship and seeking. Yani Allah's right over you that you seek him and become his servant and you worship him. Okay, so these are the two rights of Allah Azza wa Jal. And these two rights of Allah Azza wa Jal, they are, the, what, what is born from them, and what comes out and did, is deduced from them, is that uh, what is obligatory for Allah Azza wa Jal is, that, to, is, that, is the three types of Tawheed. So these two huquq, these two rights of Allah Azza wa Jal, what is born from them, are the three categories of Tawheed. What are these three categories of Tawheed? The first one is Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, the Tawheed of Lordship. The Tawheed of Lordship. 
So from the two rights of Allah Azzawajal that you've learned, which right of Allah is connected to the Tawheed of Lordship? Which is? Naam. The right to know him and affirm his existence. This is Tawheed al rububiyyah the Tawheed of Lordship. And the second type of Tawheed is Tawheed al uluhiyyah the Tawheed of Worship. And which of the two rights of Allah Azzawajal are connected to this second category of Tawheed? The second right which is the, tawheed, the right of worship and seeking. Okay? Then the third category of Tawheed is Tawheed al-Asma'i wa sifat The Tawheed of the beautiful names of Allah Azzawajal and His lofty attributes. Which of the two rights of Allah Azzawajal is connected to this third category of Tawheed? The first one which is? Knowing Him and affirming His existence. Naam. The Tawheed of knowing Allah and affirming His existence. Okay? So all of this now is Tawheed in its general meaning or specific meaning? General. general. We're still in the general meaning of Tawheed. Okay? Now we move on to Tawheed in its specific meaning. We move on to Tawheed in its specific meaning. And Tawheed, specifically speaking, is Ifradullah bil ibadah is to single out Allah Azza wa Jal and make him one in his worship. To single out Allah Azza wa Jal and make him one in his worship. Okay? And in the Sharia, the Sharia, every time we go back to your understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, the reason why you're learning these mutun is for you to understand the Quran and the Sunnah. There's no other way of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah except through this way of learning. Al mutun al ilmiya Okay? So, um, this second meaning of Tawheed, the specific meaning of Tawheed, which is what? Which is what? Singling out Allah in worship, okay? This is the meaning of, of, of Tawheed. Um, every time you see or, or, or the word Tawheed, you see it in the Quran and the Sunnah. Wahid Ahad Tawheed, every time you see it, then it doesn't mean the general meaning of Tawheed. It means the specific meaning of Tawheed. Okay? So, if Tawheed is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, then it means the Tawheed of worship. The Tawheed of worship. Which is what? The first right of Allah or the second right of Allah? Second. The second right of Allah Azza wa Jal. The prophets and messengers were sent to call to the, the first right of Allah or the second right of Allah? The second. Not the first. The second right of Allah Azza wa Okay? The prophets and messengers came to invite to the second right of Allah, which is Tawheed of worship and seeking. Why weren't, they, why weren't the, 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 the prophets and messengers told to invite to the first right of Allah? Because the people knew anyway. وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًا People inherently know there is a creator. Even those who deny the existence of a creator, Allah says, وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا They deny him. They reject him. وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ But their souls and their hearts are on, upon certainty that he exists. But the only reason they reject him is dhulman wa uluwa because of arrogance and oppression. Everyone knows deep down that there is a creator. Even atheists, you know, they, even the word God comes out of their mouth sometimes. Or they turn to the heavens. Or they po point to the sky. You know, he's up there. He's watching us. There's something watching down over you. They say this from their speech. You know? Something is watching down over us. There, there is a creator. It's inherent. Yani it's in human. Even, yani even those whose natural fitrah and disposition has been corrupted. Deep down they know. It's impossible for, for them to have been created from nothing. Allah mentions two possibilities here. That are impossible. 
either am khuliqu min ghayri shay were they created from nothing or did were they the creators so either they created themselves from nothing which is impossible or they am uh, khuliqu min ghayri shay they or, or they created themselves the first possibility or they uh, they became existent from nothing yani they they just appeared out of thin air that's impossible so if those two possibilities are impossible then it leaves the third possibility the logical possibility which is there must be a creator hence why the prophets and messengers came to affirm tawhid al ibadah only to affirm tawhid al ibadah tawhid al rububiyyah is used when, when is it used Tawheed al-Rububi is used as an evidence to affirm Tawheed al-Ibadah because al-Iqrar bi Tawheed al-Rububiya yastalzimu al-Iqrar bi Tawheed al-Uluhiya affirming Tawheed al-Rububiya believing in Tawheed al-Rububiya affirming that Allah exists okay affirming that He is the Lord and the maintainer and the creator of everything this is a this causes the person to worship him if you affirm he's the god he's a rabb then why do you worship him then you have to worship him طيب so um that is tawhid in with regards to the specific meaning now we move on to shirk we move on to shirk so shirk um in the sharia has two meanings ikhwan fi be patient inshallah this is only once a week inshallah and you yani although it takes a lot of mental energy and, and يعني, it's difficult to sit for an hour, an hour and a half to learn these things. But that's, that is knowledge, Ikhwan. We could talk about stories now and make each other laugh all day like some people do. And talk about the weather or something that makes us laugh and time would fly. We would be, t- we'd be sitting here at 10 p.m. But you wouldn't learn much. You would think you'd have the illusion that you're seeking knowledge. And you'd get up feeling good about yourself, but it's just an illusion. Okay? This is how the ulama learned. This is ta'arif. This is ta'seel ilmi. This is known as ta'seel ilmi. Ma ma'na ta'seel ilmi? It means fa- knowledge through systematic learning, foundations. You're learning the foundations, then you'll, it takes effort, it takes, it's hard. But know that inshallah ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal is pleased with you if your intention is for his sake. And that in and of itself is enough for you to, to be patient, inshallah. So shirk has two meanings. The first meaning of shirk is a general meaning, am. Okay? So now, now, now you know the pattern, right? So general, specific. So the general meaning of shirk is جَعْلُ شَيْءٍ مِنْ حَقِّ اللَّهِ لِغَيْرِهِ It is to make something which is the right of Allah Azza wa Jal to, to give it to something else or someone else. To give something which belongs to Allah solely, which is the haq and the right of Allah Azza wa Jal, and to give that something to something else or to someone else. That is the sh- shirk in its general meaning. Okay? And shirk in its specific meaning is جَعْلُ شَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْعِبَادَةِ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ To give a portion of worship we're not talking about full worship even one percent of worship to give a portion of ibadah and worship to other than Allah Azza wa Jal okay to other than Allah Azza wa Jal Jameel now that you know this if sh- when shirk is mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah which of the two meanings th- which of the two meanings come to mind if shirk is mentioned in the Quran, so, which of the two meanings does Allah mean? The specific one, not the general one, the specific one. Question. The specific one is um, regarding shirk in Tawheed al Rububiyyah, Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat, or Tawheed al Ibadah? Uluhiyah and Ibadah the same. Uluhiyah. The second meaning specific is regarding shirk in Tawheed al-Ibadah. The first meaning of shirk, the general meaning of shirk, Allah, is shirk in Tawheed al-Rububiyyah, Tawheed al-Uluhiyyah, Tawheed al-Asma'i wa Sifat. Which one? Rububiyyah and Asma'i wa Sifat. 
Does that make sense? Naam. And then he says, وَأَعْظَمُ مَا نَهَا عَنْهُ الشِّرْكُ وَهُوَ دَعْوَةُ غَيْرِهِ مَعَهُ The greatest thing that Allah Azza wa warned against is shirk. And shirk is da'watu ghayrihi ma'ah. It is to worship others besides Allah. Look, he uses da'wa, du'a. Du'a means ibadah. It's the same thing. Okay? And then he mentioned the evidence of the fact that the greatest thing that Allah calls to is Tawheed and the greatest thing that he wants against is Shirk. The evidence is, you have to, this is a very important ayah, وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا Allah Azza wa in Surah An-Nisa here, he mentions 10 things that he has prohibited. وَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى الْآيَةً Okay, and he mentions many different things, okay? Ten things that he, he calls to, he invites to. Abdullah, wa bil walidayn, be good to your, to, your, to your two parents, be good to those who are dhil qurba, your family, your relatives, wal yatama, wal masakin, wa ibn al-sabil, wal jari dhil qurba, wal jari al-junubi, wa sahibi bil jambi, al aya So Allah mentions many people that we should be good to. So this verse, wa abdullah, wa la tushriku bihi shay'a, this ibadah is Allah talking about the essence of ibadah or the types of ibadah? Types. types of ibadah. How do we know? Because he mentions types of ibadah in the verse. Okay? Naam, tfadl, read. Faida qila lak. Faida qila lak. Man bal usul al thalafatu allati ala al insani ma'rifatuha. فقل معرفة فقل معرفة العبد ربه ودينه ونبيه محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. حسبك. He says then the author رحمه الله تعالى after clarifying to you that every single person, every all of the people are created to worship Allah عز وجل and they have been commanded to worship Allah عز وجل. Then he mentioned that it is obligatory for every person to have knowledge of أصول ثلاثة. Three fundamental principles. And these principles are having knowledge of Allah, Rabbuhu, Deenuhu, Nabiyuhu. Knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal, knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, knowledge of the religion. Okay? And these are the three questions of the grave. These are the three questions that the person will be asked in his or her grave. And the reason why he specified these three things, why did he specify these things, is... Because the reason why he specified these three things is because it is impossible for a person to come with to ibadah, to perform ibadah, except by having knowledge of these three things. Think about it. A person cannot perform ibadah, do any act of worship without having knowledge of these three things. The first of these three things is to have knowledge of the one you are worshipping. The one whom you should give your worship to. Allah, if you don't have knowledge of the one you should give your worship to, then how can you worship him? That's the first reason. The second reason is that to have knowledge of the one who you should imitate when worshipping Allah. The one whom, who was sent to you so that you, can, you should copy his actions and his statements in order for your worship to be accepted. Does that make sense? Your worship is not going to be accepted if you don't imitate him and copy him. And who is he? The Prophet ﷺ. So again, the reason why we follow the Prophet ﷺ is to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. That's the second the third reason why it's impossible for you to do an act of worship without having this third one as well is to have knowledge of how to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. How to worship Him. And that is knowledge of the religion. Knowledge of the religion. Okay? Knowledge of the religion. So the first one, ma'rifatu, having knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal, is the who. Who are you worshipping? 
The second, the knowledge of the Prophet وسلم, is the the what, يعني, what is this worship? How do I know if this worship is, is correct or not? So this uh, the answer to this is by imitating the Prophet And the third uh, the third uh, يعني, sabab, or the third type is ma'rifatu ad having knowledge of the religion and this is the how, the kayf how do you worship Allah Azzawajal through this religion al-Islam al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum etc so these are the three usul هذه هي الأصول الثلاثة معرفة العبد ربه ونبيه ودينه طيب and um, if you're asked uh, what is the evidence for these usul al-thalatha what is the proof ما الدليل على هذه الأصول الثلاثة if you're asked what is the evidence for this then the answer is the answer is Every ayah and every hadith that command to ibadah. So what is the proof that it is wajib for us to have knowledge of these three fundamental principles? The proof is in every ayah and in every hadith where Allah Azza wa commands you to worship Him. That's the evidence because you can't worship Him without these three things. For مثلا يا أيها الناس أعبدوا ربكم is an evidence for هذه الأصول الثلاثة. يا أيها الناس أعبدوا ربكم is an evidence for هذه الأصول الثلاثة جميل read تفضل فإذا قيل لك أول فإذا قيل لك من ربك فقل ربي ربي الله الذي رباني وربى جميع العالمين بنعمه وهو معبودي ليس لي معبود سواه والدنين قوله تعالى الحمد لله رب العالمين وكل من سوى الله عالم وأنا واحد من ذلك ذلك العالم فإذا قيل لك بما عرفت ربك فقل بآياته ومخلوقاته ومن آياته الليل والنهار والشمس والقمر ومن مخلوقاته السماوات السبع والأراضون السبع ومن فيهن وما بينهما والدليل قوله تعالى ومن آياته الليل والنهار والشمس والقمر لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر واسجدوا لله الذي خلقهن إن كنتم إياه تعبدون وقوله تعالى إن ربكم الله الذي خلق السماوات والأرض في ستة أيام ثم استوى على العرش يغش الليل النهار يطلبه حثيثا والشمس والقمر والنجوم مسخرات بأمره ألا له الخلق والأمر تبارك الله رب العالمين والرب هو المعبود والدليل قوله تعالى يا أيها الناس اعبدوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون الذي جعل لكم الأرض فراشا والسماء بناء وأنزل من السماء ماء فأخرج به من الثمرات رزقا لكم فلا تجعلوا لله أندادا وأنتم تعلمون قال ابن الكثير رحم الله تعالى الخالق لهذه الأشياء هو المستحق هو المستحق العباد حسبك طيب so this is the final part inshallah for tonight so the author rahimahullah ta'ala here is now going to focus on which asl al-asl al-awwal the first asl okay man rabbuk that's it that's all you're going to learn that's the, the we're going to learn al-asl al-awwal tonight inshallah and we'll do the al-asl al-thani and thalith next week so al-asl al-awwal is ma'rifatul abdi rabbahu having knowledge of allah azza wa jal then so the rabb is allah the Rabb, the Lord, is Allah. Rabb means Lord, means may, means one who cultivates and nurtures. That is the meaning of Rabb. And Rabb, Rububiya, comes from Rabb. Rububiya means to cultivate, to nurture. In Arabic language, linguistically speaking, in the Arabs, they say Rabbul Usra, the master of the family. Rabbul Bayt, the head of the, ha- the household. Okay, it means the one who nurtures them, the one who is in charge of them, that's linguistically speaking. And Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he is Al-Arab with Alif Lam. The Alif Lam means that he is the ultimate Rabb. 
the ultimate nurturer, the cultivator. Do you not see how he nurtures everything? He sends down rain when a land and a particular patch of land needs rain. He's the one who uh, who يعني, uh, causes the plants and the seeds, to, to the plants to grow. Um, he's the one who, uh, يعني, he's in charge of the seasons, the four different seasons. Even when a child is growing up, how does a child grow up from being a baby to a toddler to a to a young child to a teenager to an adult and then it be, until it becomes that child becomes an old woman or an old man. So Allah cultivates and nurtures, and He is the one deserving of worship. He is the one deserving of worship. This is what you believe in. He is the one I worship. I have no other god that I worship besides Him. And the dalil and the evidence of Allah's lordship and his worship is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So he cites this as an evidence. How? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is proof of what? Rububiya or Uluhiya? Rububiya. Rububiya. Rabbul Alameen. Rububiya. Lordship. Okay? And the proof of Uluhiya. Uluhiyah and Ibadah are the same thing. Tawheedul Uluhiyah or Tawheedul Ilahiyah or Tawheedul Ibadah. All of these mean the same thing. That is Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is evidence for Tawheedul Uluhiyah. How so? Because Alhamdu, when you say Alhamdu, you're worshipping Allah Azza wa You cannot worship Allah without saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Yani you are supplicating. You're saying that you're describing Allah with the most beautiful descriptions. Yani everything good belongs to him. Everything perfect perfect belongs to him. Um, and uh, what is the minimum required knowledge that a person must have of Allah Azza wa Jal in order to qualify as a Muslim? Do you understand the question? What is the minimum required knowledge of Allah that a person must have to qualify as a Muslim? Okay, he's, so what is the knowledge that you should have of La ilaha illallah? So, so if a person knows that Allah is... What about if this person doesn't know any of Allah's names and attributes? What is the minimum required knowledge? Naam. Sorry? That Allah... Jameen, okay, that Allah has specific names and attributes, okay, what else? Naam. That he is one Lord, one Lord, one Ilah. What else, what is the, what else do you not, yani things that you have to know to qualify, basic knowledge, Naam. Sorry, one second, what did he say? Naam, existence of Allah. First, you have to affirm that he exists, right? So yeah, he has to exist. Okay? Naam. Sorry? Rabbul Alameen. Naam. So that he is the Lord of the Alameen. Naam. These, you've all mentioned four things now. Okay? So the four things that you need to have knowledge of, the minimum type of knowledge that you should have in order to qualify as a Muslim is one, okay? To have knowledge of his existence. So you have to believe that he actually exists. Okay? Number two, to believe that he is the Lord of this universe. Rabbu, he is tu'minu bi rububiyati. That you believe that he is the Lord of this universe. Number three, to believe that he is the one deserving of being worshipped alone. Besides, without associating any partners with him. To believe that he is deserving of your worship, your ibadah. And number four, to believe in his names and his attributes. You don't have to know every name and every attribute, but you to believe in his names and attributes. These are the four things that you need in order to classify yourself or class yourself as a Muslim. Jameen. Rububiyyah is a term that we hear. What is Rububiyyah? Mahi, what, 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 are, what is Rububiyyah? Naam, um, uh, Allah, Allah's actions. Okay. What about them? His um, only creation, sustenance. Naam. 
three things. So rububiyah has three meanings. What are they? Allah is the al khaliq al raziq al mudabbir Naam. So uh, al malik. You can add a fourth al malik. So to believe that Allah is the Creator. Rububiyah means that Allah is the Creator. He created everything. That Allah Azza wa is the sustainer of the universe. He sustains and maintains the universe. Without Him, there would be no universe. And finally, number three, to believe that Allah Azza wa is the possessor of everything. He possesses everything. Al Malik. Malik Yawmiddin. He's the one who possesses everything. Okay? Malik and Mudabbir have similar meanings. That is what Rububiyah means. And then he says, the author he says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, uh, Naam, wa kullu man siwa Allah alam, wa ana wahidu min thalik al alam. Everything besides Allah is a universe. Wa ana wahidu min thalik al alam, and I am one of this universe. So, what does that mean? Just to clarify what he means here. Things that are in existence are categorized into, into two. Things that are existent in existence besides Allah Azza wa are categorized into two. Okay, the, yani I'm talking about the creation of Allah. The creation of Allah is divided into two. Unique creations of Allah. They have no similarity with any other creation. Who can give me an example of a creation of Allah that is unique? Sorry? The? The, the soul. There's many souls here sitting here. It's not unique. Mm -hmm. The day and the night. The day and the night are signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal. They are His creation, but they are considered signs. Naam. Ahsant. Arshullah. Arshul Rahman. Is there a second arsh? No. We only know of one arsh. So it's unique. What else? Uh, what else? What about the kursi of Allah? The kursi of Allah Azza wa is it's unique. Okay? What about Jannah? There's only one Jannah, right? It's unique. Nar is unique. These are unique creations of Allah Azza wa Okay? The, the second type of creation are, of, are creations that are not unique, that have other similarities. And that's every other type of creation. The, the, the jinn, the ins, the hayawanat. Naam. So the word alam, alam, is associated with the first category or the second category? Alam is associated only with the second category. So you can't say the universe of, the, of Jannah. Yani the, 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 yani in terms of that, there is more than one Jannah. La. The word alam well, means in the English language, the closest translation to alam is world. Okay? Is associated with the second. So when the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, here is saying, وَكُلُّ مَنْ سِوَ اللَّهِ عَالَمْ Everything besides Allah Azza wa Jal is a alam. He means the second category of creation. Okay? The second category of creation. That doesn't mean, obviously, everything else, there's a... There's a Creator and created everything else besides Allah Azza wa Jal. He didn't say is created. That's true. But he said alam. And the word alam is associated in the Arabic language with the second category of creation. Not the first category of creation. We're talking about the Arabic linguistic meaning. So you say the Arabs, they say alamul jinn, alamul ins, alamul hayawanat, alamul namal. The world of the ants, the world of the jinn, the world of the humans, the world of the elephants, the world of... Yeah, and this is their world that they live in. Okay, so alam is associated with the second uh, category. Now, um, And then the author, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he mentions the dalil, uh, the evidences that indicate to ma'rifatul rabb. What are the evidences that indicate to Allah Azza wa Jal? And he mentions two things. Number one, Al-Ayat Al-Kawniyya. Number one is by thinking and by, by reflecting on the universal signs of Allah. 
by reflecting on the universal signs of Allah. Okay? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ By reflecting on the universal signs of Allah. The second is by reflecting on the... What's the opposite of that? What's the opposite of the universal signs of Allah? The legislative signs of Allah. By reflecting on the legislative signs of Allah. What are the legislative signs of Allah? What are the leg legislative signs of Allah? The Quran and the Sunnah, ya khwan. The Quran and the Sunnah are legislative signs of Allah. Legislative signs of Allah are what Allah revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi What did he reveal to the Prophet Muhammad? The Quran and the, the Sunnah. The Sunnah was also revealed. Naam. So, in, if you ever hear ayat, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ There's many verses that talk about the ayat. The meaning of ayat in the khitab of the shari' What does khitab of the shari' mean? Statements of Allah, statements of the Prophet Sallallahu have two meanings, okay? The first meaning are ayat kawniya, universal signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the universal signs of Allah Azza wa Jal are His creation. Are His creation. So everything that Allah created points to the fact that He exists. وَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لَهُ آيَةٍ تَدُلُّ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ وَاحِدٍ Everything points to the fact that Allah exists. وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُ وَفِي السَّمْءِ يعني Everything, even in our, our souls, indicate to the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay, those who can't see it are blinded. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Allah says, Indeed, it is not the eyes that are blind, but it is the القلوب uh, الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ It is the hearts that are in the chests that are blind. Okay, so that's the first type of ayat, universal signs of Allah, and they're the creation of Allah. The second type of ayat are the legislative signs of Allah, and they are what Allah Azza wa has revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he mentioned some examples of ayat that, um, that strengthen, uh, his, his strengthen his statements. So he mentions... Um, Al-Ayat Al-Kawniya, the universal signs of Allah. And he says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ So here he says, from the signs of Allah is the night and the day, the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon. So the question now that we have to ask ourselves, إِخْوَانِ فِي اللَّهِ Inshallah Ta'ala will be... Will be Wrapping up in, a, in, in 10 to 15 minutes. The question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Um, Al-Ayat al kawniya the universal signs of Allah Azza wa Jal. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal uh, specify them in this verse? Why did he mention the universal signs of Allah, or the, his universal signs? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر وسجدوا لله الذي خلقهم ومن آياته Allah mentions here the universal signs of Allah He didn't mention the legislative signs of Allah, correct? Only the universal signs Why the universal signs of Allah? Now, If the universal signs of Allah coincide with the legislative signs of Allah How do you mean? For example, like this surah is in like a surah and the surah is already a sign of Allah Now, but he's saying from his If someone didn't recite this surah and doesn't know this surah, Allah is saying that the night and the day and the sun and the moon indicate to his existence. Even if this person did not read the Qur'an, that would be enough of an evidence that Allah exists. So why did Allah specify uh, the universal signs of Allah? His universal signs. Do not worship, na'am. Yes. But why talk about the universal signs anyway? Why didn't Allah just say, do not worship others besides me? Okay, they, but why did he even talk about that? Why did Allah use? What, maybe, I'm, maybe my question, I didn't uh, uh, ask the question properly. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal only specify here the universal signs of Allah as proof of his existence? Naam Umar. Okay. 
So naam. So it's a khitab for everybody. It's a khitab for everyone. Which means that everyone can see it or cannot see it. Can see it. So the reason Hsent is that the, the universal signs of Allah Azza wa are clearer for everyone to see. The universal signs of Allah are, are clear for the Muslim, the non-Muslim to see. Everyone sees the night and the day. The night coming, then the day, the sun and the moon are apparent. And they are things that every human being can see. So because of this, Allah Azza wa Jal, He pointed to this fact. And uh, Rububiyyah is a path to Uluhiyyah. So if people can see the existence of the sun and the moon, and the, the, the night and the day, then technically that should tell them that something, there must be a creator that's causing all of this to happen intricately. Every single day, the day is 24 hours long every day. The sun rises, then it sets. Well, as soon as it sets, it becomes dark. When it becomes dark, the moon comes out. Then the moon disappears and the night becomes disappears and then the sun rises and, it, and when the sun rises it becomes daylight this there must be some creator out there that's causing all of this to happen so it's clearer and more awdah bin hadal bab so if the person believes that there is this creator then the second logical step is how do i worship this creator this creator who has all of this infinite power and infinite wisdom deserves my my servitude deserves my worship so how do i worship him then this person has he he's understood allah then now he moves on to the second step which is and then the deen then he learns islam then he learns how to worship that lord then he learns about the prophet muhammad then he imitates and copies him jameel um, so the author then he mentioned that from the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal are al layl wa nahar wa shamsa wa qamar So the author mentions that from the signs of Allah are four things Night, day, sun, moon, right? And then he mentions from his makhluqat, what does makhluqat mean? Creation are the seven as-samawatu sab' The seven heavens and everything in them And the seven earths and everything in them and between them Okay, so isn't the sun and the na- and the, the moon Allah's creation? So why did the author s- divide the two into two categories? Why did he mention the signs, <coughs> ayat, and then the makhluqat? The makhluqat he he did the seven heavens, he used the seven heavens and the seven earths. Why didn't he add the sun and the moon and the night and the day as the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal? No. So the, the, so the sun and the moon are makhluqat that you can see, but the seven uh, heavens and the seven earths, some of them you can't see. You're close. But has it got something to do with ayat? Yani, let me give you an example. An ayah, a sign. What is an ayah and a sign? Is it something that appears or so, and something that disappears or something that is always there? Are you sure? It comes and goes. So now in Methanan, it's night time now. There's no sun. Right? So the signs, they come and go. They appear and they disappear. In the Arabic language, the, an ayah is something that appears and something that disappears. Okay? And as uh, the brother mentioned, makhluqat, he, this, there are some makhluqat that we cannot see. So in the, he- in, the, in the oceans, in the depths of the oceans now, there are fish and species of fish that no human pers- eye has ever seen. We can't even comprehend it, them, right? They keep discovering new types of fish every day, every time. And that's, that's يعني, what, يعني, in the ocean. So there are, there are heavens, in the heavens, we haven't seen Jannah. The seven heavens, we haven't seen the seven heavens. Nor have we, have we seen the seven earths. So we don't know. So that is why 
Al-Laylu wa Naharu wa Shamsu wa Al-Qamar The night and the day and the sun and the moon uh, It is most suitable to regard them as ayat R- Although they are makhluqat But it's most suitable in the Arabic language And in the siyaq and the context of the Quran To regard them as ayat To regard them as signs And it is better and more suitable to regard the seven earths and the seven heavens as makhluqat Do you understand now? Naam. An ayah, the word ayah in the Arabic language means alama, it means a sign. And the sun and the and the, the sun is a sign. Okay, the moon is a sign, the night is a sign, and the day is a sign as well. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal He says, يعني he, and then uh, يعني the author of Allah after mentioning this, um, Allah Azza wa Jal He says. لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر. Do not prostrate to the sun and the moon. Okay. واسجدوا لله الذي خلقهن. Prostrate and worship the one who created them. This is so Allah is using rububiya now. Allah He created the sun, the, the, the sun and the moon. This is rububiya. So if you believe and you know that Allah created the sun and the moon, that should cause you not to prostrate to those to to the sun and the moon, which is a creation. But to prostrate and to worship to the create to, to prostrate yourself and to worship the Creator, the one who created them. So Allah is using Tawheed al Rububiya to indicate to Mada Tawheed al Uluhiya. <clears throat> okay? So the author then cites as an evidence three verses. So the first verse, I don't think you have it there, it's in Surah to Ghafir verse 57. Add that. Okay, La Khalqu Samawati wal Ard Akbaru. Min khalqin nas. Allah says the khalq sama the creation of the heavens and the earth are greater than the creation of people. So Surah to Ghafir verse 57. The second verse is the verse in Surah to Fusilatu min ayatihi layl wa nahar wa shams wa qamar. And the third verse is in Surah to Al-A'raf. Inna rabbakum allahu alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal ardi. Yani Allah, your Lord is Allah. Rabb. So Allah uses rububiyya here. Your Lord, that you know he's your Lord, is Allah. And he created the heavens and the earth in six days. العش, and then he rose above the throne. يعني, the night covers the day. النهار, so the night covers the day. And it seeks it quickly. So Allah uses Tawheed al to indicate and to justify Tawheed al Why is Allah worshipped? Because he's the creator. Why is he worshipped? Because he's the maintainer. Why is he worshipped? Because he's the sustainer. How can some people worship gods that do not have these qualities? They create their gods with their bare hands and they know that their gods cannot create anything. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, يعني يعني They're not able to create a single fly. You know a fly? Even if they all came together, they wouldn't be able to create it. So, a god must have these qualities in order to be worthy of being worshipped. And there's only one god, one ilah, that has these qualities, and that is Allah Azza wa Jal. Um, and then he says, وَالرَّبُّ al Ma'bud." يعني the Rabb is the one deserving of being worshipped. Okay? Um, the Rabb is the one deserving of being worshipped. Um, so what he means here, he doesn't mean that the meaning of Rabb is this. So he means that the word Rabb, that Rabb, that this Rabb is the one deserving of being worshipped. And Rabb is one of the names of Allah Azza wa When a person goes into his grave, he's going to be asked, Man Rabbuk, who's your Lord? The angel, does the angel want him to say, is the angel asking him, who is your creator? Or is the angel asking him, who is the one deserving of your worship? Which one? Deserving of your worship. So the angel is not asking about who is your creator. He's not testing you about the fact about Allah Azza wa being the creator. He's testing you. Do you affirm that he is the one deserving of your worship? And did you live your life with this? Did you live your life while you were alive on this earth? Did you actually worship him? Man Rabbuka means did you actually worship him while you were alive? And if you did worship him while you were alive, then 
you will be able to respond in the correct manner here and say Allah, Rabbi Allah, my Lord is Allah. Yani, Rabbi Allah, the one deserving of my, the one who, who was deserving of my worship, is deserving of my worship, deserves our worship, is Allah Azza wa Jal. So, um, Naam, so Ar Rabbu huwa al Ma'bud. Naam. Um, Naam. And inshallah ta'ala naqif in the hadal had. We'll stop here bi inni ta'ala and continue from there. And Al Asl al Thani from next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa sallallahu sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. لا قبة ترجى ولا وثن ولا قبر له سبب من الأسباب كلا ولا حجر ولا شجر ولا عين ولا نصب من الأنصاب